Welcome to the 1,000 Hours Outside Podcast. My name is Ginny Urich. I am the founder of 1,000 Hours Outside. I just love these podcasts. I've got uh, Andrea Davis on today. Andrea, welcome. Thanks, Ginny. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, it's so good to have you. So I'm going to read your bio here real quick so people will know who you, who you are if they don't know already. Uh, Andrea Davis is the founder of Better Screen Time. She has a BA in secondary education. However, her greatest learning has come from being in the tech trenches as a stay-at-home mom. She lives in beautiful Hood River, Oregon with her husband, Tyler, and their five children. Thanks for being here, Andrea. Thank you. I'm thrilled. It's seriously, I'm so excited. Aww. <laughs> I, you know what? I really do feel like our greatest learning comes from being in the trenches. <laughs> It does. Oh, whether it's tech or anything, we yes. sure do. We sure do learn a lot. Well, will you tell us just a little bit about your journey, Andrea? How did you end up? Um, you've got your website and your in your Instagram, and you've got a book. Um, you know, how did you end up uh, on this journey? Yeah, so it started really a long time ago. So we have five kids. Our oldest just turned 17 last month, which is hard to believe. Wow. And when she was just two we were, my husband actually was studying at Purdue at the time. So we were living in Indiana. So not too far from where you are. Mm -hmm. And I met a friend there who was a voracious reader. Like she just loved to read. And I was like, okay, what did your parents do to get you to love reading so much? Cause I love reading, but she took it to like a whole nother level. And she said, oh, well, we didn't have a TV growing up. And I was like, really? And I just was curious. Like that was, I was fascinated to be honest. Mm -hmm. And I went home and I told my husband, Tyler, I said, what would you think if we just put the TV in the closet and we use it like an appliance? So we just pull it out for a family movie night and the Olympics and yeah, whatever. And he's an engineer and he's super practical. So he was like, sure. Sounds, sounds good to me. That's awesome. Was like, yeah. He was like, that sounds great. So that's what we did. And it's kind of crazy, but here we are like 15 years later, and that's still what we do. And my kids just think that's normal. And that's awesome. um, it yeah, is normal. So it's normal for you. <laughs> normal Good. for me. So yeah. that was kind of how it started. I felt like we were really trying to be a low tech family and just prioritize other things. It was less about the TV and it was more about the other things I wanted to bring into my life, which I think is why I resonate so much with your mission and your story about getting kids outside and I think initially for me, it was just all about like, I want my kids to be readers and I want them to be curious and do all these other things. And it wasn't that my kids never watched anything or used a computer, but it just wasn't the priority. Well, yeah. fast forward years later, we, um, at the time we were living in Illinois, we made a big move to Oregon where we live now. And our oldest was in middle school and we handed over just like a leftover smartphone that we had to her just in my mind as a communication device, like here, if you don't know where to get off the bus, like call me, or yeah. if I need to get hold of you, because again, we moved to a place where I didn't know anybody and I was nervous. And, you know, I've since read a lot that parenting really changed after nine 11 and, and Columbine, where as parents, we do feel more of this need to stay connected to kids, to our kids. And yeah, it didn't take long for me to realize that it was too much too soon and that we had made a big mistake. And so we backtracked and went back to a flip phone and that was really painful. Again, this was before there were gap phones and it was hard. It was really hard. It was hard for her. It was hard for us. But I also realized at that time that we needed to have a more of a conversation with our kids about healthy tech use. So we went back to a flip phone and that was hard for our daughter. It was hard for us. There were tears all around and, but I felt so good about the, that decision and I've never regretted it. And I just thought this, we, this is like a new thing that as parents, we have to tackle and yeah. we need to be more prepared and we need to prepare our kids, but there's no guidebook or like nobody's shown us how to do this. And so my background's in teaching. Another reason why I think I resonate with you. Uh, I also have a degree in secondary ed. And so I thought, you know, how can I basically have lessons or have these conversations with my kids about healthy tech use and how we're going to do this differently than the rest of society, <laughs> which they're yeah. not going to love, 
but I, that I feel good about. So that was well, really where it started. I kind of, I love it because I think that comes full circle. What you started with was you, you started going against the grain off the beginning by putting your television in the closet. I'm curious, and I don't know if you know the answer to this, but the friend that you have, that's the voracious reader mm-hmm. that grew up without a television. Does she have a television now? I think she does, okay. but I don't think that they've ever paid for cable or anything, but at yeah, the time when we were both there, yeah, our kids were the same ages and they didn't need, they didn't even have one. So wow. we, uh, she didn't have one. And I think they eventually did, did get one. Uh, of course we live thousands of miles apart from yeah. each other now, yeah. but eventually she did, but I think it's very limited in, in how yeah. they use it. It's, and it is an interesting thing. Um, you see here and there, um, like I, I heard, I had read that Stephen King, I think in his biography or autobiography, that he didn't have a television until he was 12. Um, And so you you see these different uh, small pockets of things. And then you wonder, well, will I be in a book someday because I didn't give my kid a cell phone, you know, or (laughs) those types of things, you know, that's what stands out is the ones that are sort of going against the grain and trying it um, differently. So interesting. I think, and I think it's neat sometimes when someone like a really small thing can really affect our life. Like you got set on a path by really whoever that person was, it was her parents choice, you Mm -hmm. know, and, uh, and here you are. So, so one of the things that you brought up was this need to stay connected. And, um, I want to talk about that a little bit because Mm -hmm. Peter Gray has this book free to learn. Have you read, I'm not sure if you've read that one. I haven't. Um, it's, it's a phenomenal book and he just talks about, you know, freedom and, and play and that type of thing. And, um, I had him on the podcast last season. And so I had read most of the book, but I hadn't read the whole thing. You know, so I just Mm -hmm. want to make sure I finish. And at the very end, he taught, you'll think this is fascinating. I think Andrea, he talks about how in the eighties, he had a son who was 13 who went to Europe by himself for two weeks and wow. he's a type one diabetic. And so, wow. you know, he said the son had come to him when he was 12 and said, I really want to go. He's into Dungeons and Dragons. He said, I'm going to earn the money. I'll figure it all out. I'll figure out the plane ticket. You know, I'll figure out where I'm going to stay. I just need you to drop me off and pick me wow. up two weeks. I mean, that changed me. Cause I'm like, wow. You know, when you talk about this sort of need to stay connected, um, I mean, that that would be absolutely unheard of. Yeah. Abs- and, you know, we our son just went on his first um, uh, trip away with a with a youth camp. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, he doesn't have a phone yet. He's 13. And I, I did just feel kind of weird. Like, shouldn't I be communicating with him? Shouldn't we be connected? You know, just to have this. But then I, I think about that Peter Gray. I'm like, he was just, you know, a couple hours away with people yeah. that knew. So it wasn't even anything. This kid went by himself. So yeah. you know, where do you think this need, you know, it's a parental need too, mm-hmm. I think. Like we feel more secure when we have this ability to communicate with our kids. Like, where do you think that's coming from? Yeah. Well, I feel like almost maybe societal pressure to be a good parent, like to Mm. keep checking on our kids or to know what they're doing, because I think there's so many more checks from society, like to make sure we're parenting. Well, I'm not sure, but if we did that today, like send our kid on an airplane, our 13 year old, like People to Europe, send, yeah, to yeah. Europe. It wouldn't uh, go People would well. be reporting that. <laughs> and I mean, like, truthfully, this wasn't that long ago. I mean, you're talking three decades ago. You know, it yeah. wasn't, you know, three to four decades ago. Um, I mean, that's such a. We were even at. There's an amusement park near we live called Cedar Point. Oh yeah, and that's a pretty big amusement park, you know. And um, you know, so they're oh, this is 13. So he goes off with his friends and they, some of them even had cell phones. So it's not like he was completely isolated and, yeah. you know, all day long, I'm kind of like, oh, I, I kind of wish he had one. I kind of wish I could text and say, are you okay? And I'm glad that I couldn't do that. I think it kind of keeps mm-hmm. me in line. Um, yeah. Well, you know. I think it's good for us as parents to communicate with our kids ahead of time still. And I, I, I try really hard to do that, even with my older teen that does take a cell phone to school. Like I try really hard to talk to her about things like things that are going to happen for the day ahead of time, not texting her during the day, 
And I just think it's huge disruption. I mean, I know you, you do homeschool, but for those that send their kids to public school, it's, it's a huge disruption. <laughs> I don't know how teachers sure, even do it. Sure, to get but, text all day long. But yeah, I would but imagine just, that it takes a lot of self-control not to text your child during the day. Whether you're just checking in or you think of something, you know, um, mm -hmm. and we're just, you know, we're sort of used to that at this point, the sort of 24 seven ability to contact other people. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's something we just have to, yeah, like keep in check and really thinking about do what, can I plan this ahead and can I coordinate this ahead of time? And is this really the right time? Right. And I wonder too, if a little bit of it is like this stretching, like, so for example, when I've had now these experiences with my son, so he's 13, he's sort of at this cusp of, of going out into the world and doing things on his own. You know, now that we've had a couple of these experiences under our belt, I, I feel better about, you know, him being gone and, and living his life and making his own decisions and I don't have to check in. But if we've never had that experience, like if our child has had a phone from the time they're really young, you know, and, and we've always had this ability to check in with them, you know, I think maybe it, it would be hard to, to backtrack and not have that anymore. Totally. And you reminded me of an experience actually, my, cause my second who's in middle school, so she's eighth grade. I think it was, well, this would have been before the pandemic. So sixth grade, I remember her wanting a phone and it was like, you know, we'd had the discussion and we're not doing that yet. She said, well, what if I need to call you for something? And I said, you know, the office at the school, they have a phone <laughs> and yeah, that's what I always did. I went in and I asked if I could use it and I called my parents and, uh, sure enough, like maybe three months later, she called me from the office phone, which I was proud of that. She was even brave enough to go in and ask them if she could use the phone, but it was funny. She said, mom during PE, cause we live in Oregon and sometimes the year it's super wet. And yeah. during PE, they were outside and her shoes were like soaking wet. And she said, do you think you could bring me some shoes? And I was like, no, I can't. I'm like, you'll be, you'll be just fine. They'll, they'll dry. And <laughs> And I could tell she was kind of surprised, but she didn't bite back because she, I think she knew that that's what my response was going to be. But I think almost like you're saying, and that's those opportunities to build resilience where yeah. they know, like my mom isn't going to have to check in with me all the time. Yeah. And then they learn to solve problems on their own. Yeah. <laughs> so if we never give them the opportunity, they don't build that, that skill really. Right. Right. Yeah. And I think it's resilience for us too, as parents, you know, where I'm like, I had to, I was like really wishing I could communicate, but then I'm like, you know, this is good for me to grow and, and realize that he's fine, you know, yeah. and you know, that Peter Gray sends his kid to Europe, you know, and he said, I said, asked, I said, did you talk to him at all? You know, and he said he <laughs> called one time, you know, called collects is super expensive. Wow. You know, and so <laughs> then I think you would have the confidence, you know, you really learn that your, your kid is capable, you know, yes. and, and that, you know, they're, you know, um, they're taking care of things. So yeah. Uh, you, yeah. It's an inter interesting thing. I think this, it's like a stretching thing and it happens on both ends. Totally. Um, I love that. Yeah. So I, mean, I don't know. It's an interesting topic, this need to stay connected, because I feel like um, I feel like it's on both. You know, you feel it on both sides that the parents feel it and the kids feel it. And Definitely. it's a change. It's a change from how things used to be. Um, yeah. OK, so you talked about that. There were a lot of tears with the backtrack to the foot phone. What, mm -hmm. what were the what were the major what is the biggest concern? Like, what is the biggest concern? What causes the tears the most tears? you yeah, know, from a child's I think, perspective. I think it for her at that age, it was being different than everyone else. Aww. And I think yeah. it'll be different for every child. And again, I think there's, there's benefits to homeschooling some for, for that reason, but there's definitely this need to fit in with yeah. what everyone else is doing. And she was so yeah. embarrassed that she had this flip phone and it was just like, shove it in your locker and don't let anybody Aww. see it. And that's so hard. Yeah. And it is. And parents ask me all the time, like my, my kid feels so left out. And do you know, what's really yeah. hard mm -hmm. is when it's not just not fitting in, but it's when they're in a social circles and yes. everyone else does have a phone yes. and nothing for them to do. 
Let me tell you my story. So my yeah, I would love to hear that. So I have a daughter that is um okay, so we homeschool, so I can never remember the grades. She's a sixth grader um mm -hmm. this year. And so last year was the pandemic. So then the year before she played on a rec basketball team in our area. She was a fourth grader. And um I remember we had gotten to one of her games early. She's fourth grade. I mean, that's little. I think she was 10 or something. Yeah. And uh, we got to one of her games and, and we were there a little bit early and all the other girls had a phone and they were mm -hmm. and they were all on their phones and doing TikTok dances and, and doing these different things. And, and our daughter didn't have one and hadn't even necessarily been exposed to one either. And I, I cried, not in yeah. front of her, but I saw it that she just fell out of place. There was yes. nothing for her to do and there was no way for her to connect. And it really grieved me, um, you know, and so so I could see that there's pressure on all sides there too. There's mm -hmm. pressure for the child, but then there's also pressure for the parent because who wants their kid to be the one that's ostracized or, you know, um, or just they're feeling uncomfortable. And so, gosh, there's not easy yeah. answers. No, there, there isn't. I mean, answers. it's such a bad feeling. But I mean, now that yeah. she's older, you know, I've, she's done a few things with me where she's had younger kids asking, well, what do I do when everybody else is on their phone? And and she said, you know, you try to strike up a conversation about other things yeah. and just try to engage with them about things that aren't on the phone. And some, some kids will engage back and other times they won't, and they're just going to stay sucked into their screen. Yeah. And, but I think too, this is kind of the, one of the ways we find our people. And yeah. it's not that we only are going to interact or be friends with people that do things exactly like we do. And right. But it's also just, you know, hey, oh, you're, you don't have a phone either. <laughs> and then it's like, you find that other person that looks lonely. And again, I think it's, there's always a lesson or a teaching lesson yeah. for our kids and, and thinking, okay, well, can you look up and look out and find that other kid that doesn't yeah. have a phone? And in some situations, like with your daughter, where she's on a team, there might not be another one when you're in like I a know. structured place where you yeah. can't really just go looking for that person. But yeah. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah. It really is. Yeah, it's an interesting day and age that our kids are growing up in. I think, you know, I think that parents in schools can do a lot to really protect kids from that ostracization. You know, um, I'm not quite even sure if that was a word, ostracization. I don't know. All <laughs> that right. made sense to All me. Right, I don't know. Okay. Uh, but, you know, like there's that wait till eighth program. Yeah. You know, I'd where parents them. are you know, committing. And I don't know if they have a way where you can connect with the other parents, but you know, and I talked to a, a Waldorf school. So, okay. So the Waldorf schools are interesting and, and those tend to be private. And I think that they're, you know, fairly pricey. I, they're not necessarily an option for, you know, most families, although there are some public or charter Waldorf schools, which I think is cool, but yeah, you know, totally. they used to have the Waldorf schools would have this, um, like you had to sign this contract that your kids couldn't watch television from Sunday night to Thursday night, you know, that hmm. there was no TV. And so this was like, you know, this maybe would have been decades ago. Yeah. And I thought well, it was so interesting because like, I remember being in school and, and being like, oh, I, I wasn't allowed to watch certain shows or wasn't able to or whatever the situation was and you go to school and you're the only one who didn't see you know that's how yes. tv used to be like you're the only one that didn't see the tuesday night thing and everybody's talking yeah. about it and you're left out and so yeah now i think that they have transformed that to also include cell phones you know yes. that you have you have to sign this contract where you have to wait so then your kid mm. is not the only one that's what a so protective nice. measure for the child yeah. you know to not have to be wouldn't, I mean, it's like as a that society, I know it would be, obviously that's not, it's not in the cards. So that's why your material is so important and, yeah. and so helpful. Do you find that the Gab phone, and for those people who don't know, Gab Wireless is a real cool company. They came out with a, a, a non-smartphone, uh, but that mm -hmm. looks like a smartphone um, for, for the sake of fitting in and and also teaching safe technology in steps to children do you find that that because I don't have any experience with it like does that mm -hmm. fit the bill you yeah know, it's working it well for us yeah. I I yeah definitely it's a great first step so our eighth grader and our seventh grader share one and I yeah. also like that too because 
they have to share it. And so they kind of can keep each other accountable and they don't really, we live pretty close to our school, so they don't really take it to school unless there's some reason after school, I need to connect with them, but yeah, they just leave it here, but they can use it to connect with their friends. And so they like that. And it's just great because there's no internet access. Yeah. So so we, um, they stuff. sent us one to try it out and, um, you know, and, and I really like their company. They do all sorts of things that are promoting hands-on experiences for kids and they have competitions yeah. and they're doing really cool things, but you know, people send you stuff and they, and they want you to share about it. Um, and of course I, you know, love the product and want to share about it, but the ironic thing was we hardly ever used it, which is the yeah. point. That's the point. You know, we had like this three month trial and, you know, I'm like, I have glowing reviews because it's just sitting on the counter, you know, but, um, you know, so I have, I'm like, I don't have any content. I don't have any pictures. No one's really, you know, but that's the point. It's not sucking them in and stealing their time. And um, so I think they've got a great a really great solution. Yeah. And I totally understand that. Like we were actually been testing out some other phones that are kind of the next step after Gab. So there's Trumi and Pinwheel and they both have like approved apps. So it's not social media, but it's like certain apps that you can only download. But again, we're not quite there yet. I have like an older teen that's 17. That's that's, she actually still has limited access, but has an iPhone And then I've got, so, but we're kind of getting ready to move to that next step. So, yeah. Well, okay. So speaking of that, let's talk about your book. Cause you talk about steps in there. So this is called creating a tech healthy family. Um, 10 must have conversations to help you worry less and connect more with your kids. This is a fantastic resource. There's not, uh, not that I've seen nothing else out like, like this, the 10, these 10 must have conversations. Like you said, no one, no one's done this before. So there aren't, yeah. there aren't, um, many practical resources. So you talk about this, you have a four phase approach in your um, book about introducing technology to children. And, and I think that whole concept is a good one that in every other, you know, at stratosphere of life that we, we teach things in succession. So, um, yes. can you talk about the four, this four phase approach? Yeah. Well, I, again, I was baffled with what to do with our oldest and this is pre-gab and, and these other options. And I, I'm a person of faith. So I still remember actually just kneeling down and praying. And I was like, what do I do here? Because, you know, hiding the TV worked so well for so long, but I had, I need some new strategies here. And I just had the scripture come to mind, line upon line, precept upon precept. And I think that can be applicable in any, you know, for anyone, no matter if they're a person of faith or not. And I just was like, okay. And this was really the image that came in my mind was just this succession of this four phase process. And so like it was starting with a flip phone, which now could be the gab watch or the gab phone as well. Yeah. But again, those aren't available outside of the U S so you know, there's parents all over yeah, the world interesting. who are struggling with this. And so they'll tell me, well, we don't, we can't get a gab phone. So I'm like, you know, you find the most basic thing you can find that has no internet access. That's, that's the main point at that first step. And again, really deciding if there is a need for that. And we, what we did as a family is we actually, I, we asked our kids two questions. We said, what does it mean to be responsible? And what does it mean to be emotionally mature? And it's kind of, you know, a lot to unpack, but we talked about it. Like if you're responsible, you do your homework, you do your chores without being asked. And if you're emotionally mature, you're kind to your siblings and you don't throw a fit when you don't get your way. And so we made this big list. And at the end, we told the kids, yes. And those are the things that a person needs to do before they can have a cell phone because it's a huge responsibility and there's so much power in, in that small device. And so that was kind of how we started. So just, and that's available on our website on betterscreentime.com, that self-evaluation, but we start with that with our kids. And then it's that first phase of something simple with no internet. And then we're moving on to, and this could just be again, still a gab phone, but maybe something like the true me or the pinwheel where it's very limited. Maybe you've got a camera and you've got calculator. And then the next step is adding some useful apps. So again, sometimes parents will say, well, my child's team coach uses this, or 
in this classroom, Mm -hmm. they're using this. And again, that's something that parents encounter more when they're sending their kids to public school. And so that way you can just allow a few apps, which is what those Mm -hmm. other next phase phones allow. And then that very last thing is social media. And again, for me, that is like an older teen that's maybe about ready to leave home, but, and, and it's still limited. Like you're deciding together what social media apps are appropriate, what, what lines up with your family's values, and then having a time limit for those things and making sure that you're following your child and, and that you have that communication. I mean, there's just a lot of, um, these discussions that need to happen yeah. and a lot of like foundation that needs to be laid before we ever introduce social media, because yeah. that's where a lot of the problems come in. So. Yeah. Um, this is not the information I think that you're finding out there. I think that, you know, for the most part, we're just handing kids the real thing, you know, right yeah. off the bat and, and then maybe really struggling because, you know, it goes downhill quickly and, and then you're reeling and trying to figure out what to do. I love in your book. Um, I mean, really, it's just fantastic information. It, you know, so for example, so for that, for that piece about the stages, like you had talked about, you know, you have this whole list of discussion questions, you know, yeah. just, I mean, and these are really, these are really good prompts. Like if you talk to your kids about, uh, you know, I like this question, like, why can't we feed a baby a hamburger? Yeah. <laughs> You know, I mean, these are, these are really thought provoking ways to introduce to the, to a child, let's say a child who's seven or eight or nine, you know, that really wants a smartphone because every other kid has one in their class or, or their friend group, you know, then this, this gives you a way to really talk about it so that they can understand, you know, we're going to do it in this, in this phase approach. I like this question that says this, if you were a parent, how would you teach your kids to use technology step-by-step? So, um, just really thought provoking questions in here that, um, you know, would help a family guide, would help guide a family through these, these are nuanced things. They're layered. Yeah. And I think what is important is that, and for parents to understand is that by sharing this process or talking about things, it doesn't mean that you're giving your child a phone. It means that you have an opportunity to engage in conversation about why yeah. you're not doing a phone yet. Because yeah. again, we can only just say no, no, no for so long, because of course right. we all know what the next question is from a child, but why? Yeah. And so if we start from the foundation and we're talking about the why from the beginning, then they're like, oh, okay, my, you know, I might not like it, but I know why my mom or dad doesn't yeah. want me to have a phone yet because they want me to spend time outside. They want me to be using my hands or they want me to be reading or just spending time with yeah. my friends and, right. and not sucked into a phone. Well, and I think this gives kids strategies for when they become parents, you know, because a 17 year old is not, you know, may not be that far, yes. you know, e- even I, we've got a 13 year old. I mean, it may be, it may be a while, it may be a decade, it may be two decades, but you know, it's, it's not all that far off. And so I think part of our parenting now, um, is it, we have to prepare them, you know, yes. for, for a world that will probably also, um, include even more technology and, um, you know, so, so your book gives them something to go on, right? Yeah, Where we don't exactly. have any, we don't have anything right now, right? We have, we, you know, this is a new thing came out in 2009, you know, the iPhone. And so now this is giving our modeling for our kids ways that they can, um, they can parent, uh, when, yeah. when the time comes. Yeah, exactly what you said. I had that same thought. I mean, my daughter's 17 and I've thought, you know, it really won't be that long before she's going to be doing this. And I'm yeah. sure, you know, like all parenting, there's some things you are like, you like that your parents did and other things that you didn't. But I, if we can lay that foundation, they'll be so much pr- more prepared than, than we were because yeah. it's kind of just got thrown at us. And obviously technology is going to change and advance, but that's yeah. why, you know, we're giving them those tools so that as it changes and advances, they'll know, they'll know what to do. They'll know mm-hmm. what's really important. And, and that it, it's that connection and those relationships with one another that we have to preserve yeah. for, you know, before technology gets in the way. So, right. 
Uh, it's interesting, and you talk about, um, you know, what's coming. I had just, I recently read um, Maria Von Trapp's book. So she's from The Sound oh. of Music, or, you know, mm-hmm. that, was, that it was based off of, you know, the Von Trapp family singers. And, um, and so we watch The Sound of Music. My kids are in voice lessons. And so we watched recently. Oh, and, I love um, the Sound And of I music. love it. My kids are like, yeah, okay, whatever. They weren't, they weren't <laughs> as enthralled. But um, so anyways, I was just curious and I, and I ended up reading, um, her story, she wrote it. And, and, and I was actually really surprised. She has this quote in there. It's from 1949. She says, our age has become so mechanical that this has also affected our recreation. People have gotten used to sitting down and watching a movie, a ball game, a television set. It may be good once in a while, but certainly it is not good all the time. Our own faculties, our imagination, our memory, the ability to do things with our mind and our hands, they need to be exercised. If we become too passive, we get dissatisfied. And I was like, Oh, I mean, this is 70 years old, right? That, wow. you know, we have been grappling with sort of these, this issue of, of where our time goes for a long time. But, you know, what I, what I noticed in your book, which is interesting, is you had it split up. Like you talk about video games, social media, and video streaming. So mm-hmm. I thought that was interesting too, which is like, um, there are different components to that. And so can you tell us how, you know, how might those conversations go with a child about like the different, you know, so for a while it was just television, right? You know, it's yeah. radio and there's television. And really for a long time, it was just television, you know, and then there was video games, you know, and now there's these other things. So, so do you, um, do you like have pointed conversations about the, you know, the different things? Cause they are different. Yeah, I, we started by having a general conversation about it and about how we use our time, but then specifically talking about each thing I think is helpful. And yeah. I think just starting with what is the biggest problem in your home <laughs> or what, or what's the thing that comes up the most often? Is it YouTube, you know, or right. people just wanting to watch YouTube all the time or, you know, video games aren't a huge topic in our home is something that we have just mostly said no to. It's not a priority for us, but I know there are families out there that that's one way they love to connect even with each other. And so I'm not mm-hmm. saying that's bad. I want to give them the tools and resources to make the best decision for their family. But I knew that I still needed to let my kids know why we chose not to do have video games. And so I'm not against, you know, if they play a video game at their cousins or at a friend's, as long as it's appropriate and there's a time limit, then, you know, I I don't have a problem with that, but it's just not part of our family culture. And so that's, uh, that was how our conversation went about video games, but we talked about them. Like, you know, they're, they're different than they used to be. Uh, Again, my husband played some video games growing up, but he remembers saving up like $70, going to the store, buying a video game and playing it for a while. And then eventually getting bored because he had all these other things that he liked to do. Plus there was, this is the other thing that's changed is there's kind of like a finite time or, you know, there was a time limit. You can win it. You win it and you're done. Yeah. Or, but now, well, another thing is just the internet. The internet changed everything because a lot of these games are available online or connected online. So it doesn't ever end. Right. And there's all these additional things that you can buy to make it more exciting. And obviously the graphics are way cooler. So it's just like sucking kids in way more than they used to. So if that we talked about that a lot, like video games just aren't what they used to be. Right. And then, you know, I have, I have five kids, but only one son. So I have four girls and obviously girls are usually more interested in social media than boys are. And so we've had more conversations in our home about social media than we have about video gaming, because yeah. that's more of the interest. And my son, thankfully, doesn't really shown any interest in video games. And he loves, he loves being outside plants are his thing. And so I, I just love it. It's great. <laughs> and it's easy, but you know, I think in every home, there's going to be different things that you will have to 
repeat the conversation about and return to. And then I think video streaming is something that's affecting, you know, most people and, and partly because it is a nice way to unwind and relax, but it's also very useful. Like think of, you know, my husband fixed our van door. Like we had an automatic van on our minivan door and it broke and he looked it up on YouTube and yeah. showed him how to fix it. And it cost him like $20. So that's, what's tricky is that yeah. it can be useful. So we talk to our kids a lot about the three C's and I'm not sure that I really put this distinctly in the book, but we talk about, are we creating connecting or consuming? And when it comes to screens, we want to spend most of our time either connecting or creating (laughs) and that consuming piece needs to take up a very small part of our time. And when we're consuming, what does that look like? Well, the best kind of screen time is together screen time. So if we are consuming, then can we sit down and watch a movie as a family or, you know, with our siblings or something like that? So that's also a helpful distinction to make when you're having this conversation. Uh, the video streaming is interesting because, you know, it's like our world is filled with brilliant people, you yeah. know, and, and creative and funny and and full of life. And so I think that's the thing about YouTube. It's like we used to get served content from just whoever ran the television programming. And that's all yeah. you got. Well, now yeah. you got, you know, you got access to a world, uh, a wide uh you know, everyone, everyone yeah. who's doing cool things and every and it is interesting. Honey, it's funny. And, um, yeah. you know, so I like that. I like that you broke that down because it's not something that I had really thought about, which is like, you know, you really have to tackle each one for what it is because they are different from each other, mm-hmm. um, you know, and have their different pros and cons and their different hooks. And, yeah. um, so I really, I really liked that part. Um, it's a, it's a difference from how things used to be where, you know, it was mainly just television and now there are these other things and, and maybe there'll be other things, you know, like virtual reality or, yeah. um, you know, there's other things that are coming too. So the metaverse. <laughs> yeah. Right. So to know that as parents, like, and this knows. Isn't, right. This yeah, isn't no, a one, ahead. this isn't a one path thing. There's many branches to it and, and they're different. And so just totally. good to be aware. Um, of that. Yeah. Uh, uh, you have these questions I, I thought were really helpful. When, where, what, how long? Yeah. Uh, so I, yeah. Tell us about yeah. those. Well, we were trying to come up with a family tech plan. And when I first did it, I just, I did a lot of research and I let, I read um, glow kids and I read reset your child's brain, a lot of these great books and it was helpful but I also kind of started parenting from a place of fear in some ways. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to set the rules. Here's how it's going. And that did not go over very well, especially because my older kids were already, you know, the skin like middle school and at about that age, which you and I know at that development that they're really becoming more independent at that age mm-hmm. and they're supposed to. Right. So I realized I needed to get my kids on board and my spouse and create this family tech plan together. And we just needed something simple, like a simple framework to decide what, how are we going to use technology? So we talked about, you know, where, well, okay, let's keep screens out of the bedrooms and bathrooms. And that's a protection that's a safeguard for everyone, including parents. And I learned that my bedroom can be a sanctuary. You know, if I don't take my laptop in there, then it's a place for me to rest and relax and not to work (laughs) and Mm -hmm. also a place for relationships. And, you know, I noticed that with several of my kids share bedrooms uh, because we have a small house and I love hearing my 17 year old and my 14 year old giggling at night, you know, they're girls and they're just chit chatting at 10 or 11 o'clock at night. And I think, what if I would have never said, we're not taking screens in the bedroom. What if, you know, when all those cool devices came home during the pandemic, what if they had gone in the bedroom? And then I just think those conversations wouldn't be happening. And so those, you know, just deciding where you're going to use screens, that's a nice safeguard. And then what, like, what are we going to do on them? What lines up with your family's values and having a 
really like just clear conversation about this, like what's okay and what's not okay. And let's, if you're not sure, let's talk about it ahead of time. Because again, we might really be low tech in our home or feel like we have these strict standards, but our kids are not always going to be in our home. Like they're going to leave, like your son's going to go to a youth outing and our kids leave our home. And so we kind of have to have these conversations about what's okay. And, and then talking about like how long. And I think again, like we can look at the, the standards by the American Academy of Pediatrics, but again, once the kids are over five, it's pretty vague. It's kind of like, you know, just make sure everything else is in check and in balance. And so we talked about, well, how do you feel if you're on a screen for too long? Like, and, and the kids, you know, we just kind of talked about behavior and mood swings and irritability and those kinds of things. And that's so good for the kids just to, cause they're kind of recognizing. Mm-hmm. And then we said, well, how long do you think is too long? And again, this is different really for different ages and depending on what you're doing on the screen too. Like if you are being creative, my daughter loves to write stories with her cousin. So they'll get on a Google doc together and she lives in another state and they'll write stories together and they might do that for an hour. And I'm like, I'm okay with that because they're doing it together and they're creating, but I don't want her spending an hour watching YouTube. (laughs) Right. And so again, you can kind of talk about that, like how long, depending on what we're doing, And then, you know, so where, where, when, what, how long, all those questions are things that we can decide and and having those screen-free times of day that are just really kind of sacred that Mm -hmm. we're having dinner time without screens or we're going on a walk or a hike and we're going to leave our phones at home or we're going to just take the camera or we're going to put our phone on airplane mode. So we just take pictures and we're not checking texts or whatever that is for your family, yeah. but just being intentional. They're, about they're it. really good strategies. I mean, they're really good, you know, you know, to, to have those conversations and for kids to understand why, you know, I think phones make you feel lethargic sometimes too. Like you yeah. just don't feel like getting up and doing anything. And kids are smart. They know their bodies. And so, you know, I, I love that, you know, to say, to talk about your book one more time. I mean, there are so many questions in here. Our kids love getting asked questions, by the way. Yeah. They love it when we ask them stuff. They're like, ask us more questions. Oh, so, that's you know, awesome. that you have, um, you know, they like to talk and they like to think. And so, you know, with each of these, I mean, the book is about discussions. Ten must have yeah. conversations. And they really are conversations, right? Yeah. Like, you know, where you have, um, you know, so there's all these discussion questions and you don't have to do them all at once. But, you know, even if you had them on little note cards or, you know, you're out and about and you're ready to, you know, you have a little chance to talk or like, I like this totally. question. What would life be like without any rules? I mean, these are, these are really good questions. So um, I like the, I like the where, when, what, how long. And um, yeah, you, know, you could talk you, about that. We're in the driver's seat of our own life. Yeah, totally. And I don't know if you're familiar with like Gretchen Rubin's four tendencies for like everybody's I'm not kind of a different thing, but I'm a questioner. That's like, there's like, okay. I don't remember what they all are, but I was like, oh, this explains a lot because I'm not necessarily rebellious, but I just like to know why. And I think that's one of the reasons why I was drawn to teaching and being a teacher, but yeah, it's good. Like, and we learn best when we're the ones that discover the answer, right? Yeah. And if someone tells us or lectures to us. And so that's why this is all built around asking good questions. And again, yeah, you don't have to ask every question in here. They're really just prompts to get you thinking. Yeah. And I think parents are so, can be so inspired as they start to engage in these conversations. I think you'll be inspired or prompted to ask maybe even other things that might be more fitting for your family or that Mm -hmm. are going to help your kids discover an answer that will help them make this decision about how they want to use screens at some point. So, yeah. Yeah. You end with, um, uh, stress relief or that's near the end, Yeah, uh, which I thought was, um, it's really cool. You, you cover just such a wide variety of topics. There's 10 in there. It covers, it seems like it covers the gamut. Um, and interesting to see that you have stress relief in there. Um, why, why is it an important discussion to talk about stress relief with, with kids? Yeah. Well, when I first started this journey, again, I did a lot of research and I attended a 
seminar given by Dr. Christakis, Dimitri Christakis, and he is one of the lead researchers when it comes to early like screen time with really young children and toddlers. And he's in, up in Seattle and he's fascinating to listen to. If you could get him on the podcast, it would be amazing, but yeah. he, I've not he, heard of him. Tell me, tell the name one more time. Yeah. It's Dimitri Christakis. Okay. And if you look up just, he did a 60 minutes interview about how kids need laps, not apps. That's okay. like really one of my favorite things and you'll Aww. find it. Okay. But he is so smart, but he just talked about how he's a pediatrician. And in his experience that kids would, he was starting to see this change where kids would get their immunizations or, you know, whatever procedure they were getting and they would cry because it hurt or they were sad. And instead of parents, instead of, you know, hugging their kids, like they used to and consoling them, they instead were handing them a device and that, you know, wow, really the con- fascinating. Yeah. And, and so he was watching this before his very eyes that like, okay, five years ago, parents would hug their kid and the kids would learn that that's where they went to get, you know, consoled and comfort was from their parent, which is how it should be for little kids yeah. and big kids really. But instead the kids were learning to be content with this device and, you know, I think we're seeing that everywhere. And yeah. uh, even as adults that we might just, we're bored, we're tired, or we just want to numb ourselves. We're, ir- we're irritable. Yeah. yeah. Sure. And all this would be easier to check Instagram or whatever. And so I just was fascinated by that. And so I, I thought, well, how interesting that as phones have been around longer and longer, that parents are starting to say, why is my teen always on their phone? Or why does my teen just want to go to their room and be on their phone? And I'm in my mind, it just kind of clicked. And I was like, wait, because we've been training them this way all along it. And it just breaks my heart that, you know, they're not turning to parent that maybe their parent. And I'm not saying like, oh, we're bad parents of our kids don't turn right. to us because sometimes kids just don't want to talk right. to us and sure. that's okay. But again, like we do want to be the one that they come to and they have a problem and, or if they don't want to come to us, we want them to have healthy coping skills and things that they can turn to. And I think one of the things I talked about in the book was like Calvin and Hobbes. Like I tended to take things very seriously. Like I took school very seriously, everything I did, I just wanted to do it just right and perfect. And that doesn't work well, you know, and I didn't do drugs. I didn't drink. I didn't do any of those things. So it's like, I needed something. And I, I remember just discovering Calvin and Hobbes and being like, oh, this is like the perfect <laughs> little escape. And mm-hmm. so I think just having that conversation with your kids and talking about what are those things for you? Like what's your Calvin and Hobbes or what's your thing that just makes you happy, you know, yeah. going outside and going on a walk and, you know, for me growing up, that was, that was another escape. I grew up, my dad's a farmer and I grew up in the country and I just loved escaping outside, but you know, that's not available to all kids, you know, a kid in an apartment in New York city, that's, that's not available. And so we just, I think having a conversation with our kids and making a big list, like what do we do when we're stressed? And I think that would help solve a lot of the problems that our kids are having today, you know, just recently the uh, surgeon general sent out an advisory on youth mental health, declaring it really a public health crisis. And we're, we're so concerned about that, about our youth and their mental health and, and we should be in, it's not all to do with the phones. I think there's a lot of factors and he cites those things in the advisory, but technology is one of them. And so just helping our kids relieve stress in other ways. Yeah. It's <laughs> a good, good they, idea. Um, they talk about that in the social dilemma movie, um, yeah. uh, which I was a part of a panel or something I, I saw a while back, but that was actually one of the parts of that movie that really stuck out to me because that's what they said. They said that kids are turning to their phones, you know, in moments of stress. And so they're not learning these different coping mechanisms or resiliency, um, you know, if the phone is always there. And I thought that was really interesting. I liked to read, you know, I mean, so, you know, you escape in a book and, Mm -hmm. and there are so many healthy ways, I think, 
to deal with stress um, that, that, that then have other benefits as well. Yes. You know, so it's almost like, you know, you had your questions up there and maybe a question that goes along with it is why, you know, why am I getting on the screen right now? You know, is like, um, you know, is it because I'm trying to learn something to fix my car? It's because I'm trying to communicate with a friend. We're texting. I'm trying to set up plans or whatever, I, you know, but if the answer, you know, is, is leaning heavily toward just stress relief, um, you know, it's good to teach our kids other uh, other options. Totally. So. Yeah. And we talk a lot about that, like pausing, we have this tech healthy family formula and, and that second step. Oh, of I like that. that. Is, yeah. And it's, and it's all like starting with, um, really, uh, promoting connection with other people and then pausing and then we prepare and then we protect and then we practice and there's a lot more to that. It's, it's in our course, creating a tech healthy family, but so it's not in the book because I developed it after I wrote the book and it, well, it's that's a big cool, though. I mean, you're, course. Yeah. You're continuing to add to what you have. So, so yeah. let's talk about that really quick. So I, um, I read this book, creating a tech healthy family it, um, is available on Amazon and um, is it available anywhere else? Do you guys have is that on your website or where's the best place for people to get this? Is Amazon yeah, the best place? Right now it's just on Amazon because great. I self-published it during the good pandemic. And <laughs> yeah, it's, it's that's great. That's what it is for now. It's a great book. We self-published too. It's a, it's a great option. So it's a quick option too, you know, yeah. that a regular publishing cycle is 18 months, you know, to oh, two wow. years. Um, so if you want to get something out quickly and you want to be timely, uh, it's yeah. a great option. So, um, yeah, so this is fantastic. Creating a tech healthy family, 10 must have conversations and they really are conversations to help you worry less and connect more with your kids. So Andrea, you, you guys have that on Amazon and then tell us about your course. Yeah. So I just, I think that these conversations work well for some parents, I think parents that are used to engaging in these kinds of, of conversations, but it sounds like you are, cause you said your kids like them asking questions, but I have some parents who are like, my kids hate this or they hate that, or they're not used to that. They've never had like a family sit down meeting or they've not really engaged in those kind of teaching moments in that way with their kids, or they're just struggling a lot more, or they just want more of the research. Again, the, the book doesn't really have much of the research because I felt like a lot of the research was already available. You know, I really was standing on the shoulders of giants, like people who like, you know, glow kids and these other great books that had been written. And I thought, I just wanted to give parents the, the quick discussion guide, but some parents need more than that. And so we have a course and I actually start with helping you as the parent with your healthy tech habits. Mm -hmm. And that's because a lot of people would say, well, really, you know, I can't blame my kids because I'm on my phone all the time too. Right. Or I just would have parents say, they don't really have a real problem, but they're just like, well, I could be better. I could be a better example. And I felt that way when we were starting to engage in these conversations, I thought, well, starts with me, right? Like yeah. the change starts with me. And so that's one of the big differences between the course and the book is that I help you as a parent. We talk a lot about the research. And then the next step is working with your spouse or partner, because that's also an essential piece mm -hmm. that I kind of glossed over in the book, just because again, I was trying to make this simple, but some people need a little bit more help with that. Like and not even, yeah, people talk even, about that all the time. Like what if yeah. my spouse isn't on board, you know, yeah. and, and I would imagine it's even a thing if you have, um, you know, if you're dealing with step parents or step family, yes. um, you know, kids that are maybe back and forth, um, with different custody arrangements or that, you know, those things can be tricky to navigate as well. Totally. And I talk about that in the course, like, you know, your situation might be different. You might be a single yeah. parent, but everybody's got someone else that's helping probably with the kids in some yeah. way, some caretaker. And so I kind of give them the discussion points of like, here are some decisions that you will want to make now, because I wish I would have had this, like, when are we going to yeah. hand over a phone or, or are we, and then the next, um, two parts of the course are working with your kids. So you're really doing that preparing and that's where the research and the conversations come in and you're creating a family tech plan. And then 
you're protecting. And my husband, thankfully he's a mechanical engineer. He works as a software engineer, but he walks parents through setting up open DNS on their home router, which is just like a basic filter. That's free that I think a lot of parents don't know they can use. And yeah. so he walks, these are the practicalities. That. People need this. Information. Yeah. 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 And so that's in the course. And then the last step is just pra- practice. And so we help parents like, okay, here's how we can put these things into place. And, you know, everybody's comments come straight to my personal inbox. So it's just more of me hand holding and supporting and a little bit more community than, you know, you would get from a book. And so they're both great options, just depending on what yeah. people need. So Andrea, if people are trying to find you and find this information, where's the best place for them to go? Yes. So our website, betterscreentime.com, or you can also find us ironically on Instagram or Facebook at better screen time. And I would love to connect with people there. I, you know, I do my best to practice healthy tech habits. I take a day off social media every week. I take every Sunday off and, you know, that can be hard trying to grow uh, social media and reach parents and also practice tech healthy habits, but I'm trying doing my best. And, yeah. um, I am there to teach when I think, okay, the reason why I'm there is to teach parents yep. and I'm a teacher. So yeah, that's, that's your I'm there to help. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, well, I really, this is so helpful. This has been so helpful. And, and I know that you're continuing to put out content that's helpful for parents. So it's so great for them to connect with you. Uh, we always end Andrea with um, a favorite hands-on real life moment from your childhood, a tech-free moment, um, maybe one that's outside, uh, but something that you can share that, that you loved from when you were a kid. Yeah. Well, first off, I just have to say, I think this is one of the reasons why I connect with you or resonate with you so much is, um, I'm probably going to get emotional, but being outside for me as a kid was like, it was just, it saved me. Like I loved being outside. And I think that's one of the reasons why I wanted to start better screen time was because I was, um, sad at seeing kids missing out on these opportunities to be free and to really experience childhood. But we had a gravel pit not far from our house and it was just owned by the county. And I spent so so much time there. You can ask my mom, but I am the youngest of three and my oldest sister is eight years older than me. And my brother is four years older than me. So I didn't really have, and we lived in the middle of nowhere. So I didn't really have a lot of playmates. It was pretty much my cat and my dog. And so I would go to this gravel pit and I would catch snakes and I would catch salamanders and I would catch tadpoles. And my mom was always wondering what I was going to bring home next. So (laughs) most of my happy memories revolve around this gravel (laughs) pit and it was called the pit. Like everybody in, I mean, we lived in the middle of nowhere, but there were other houses, but everybody knew what the pit was. And so, um, you know, a couple of occasions, but I, I brought home a tadpole and actually grew it into a frog. And I know when I brought it home and my mom was like, what are you going to do with that? And I'm like, well, I'm going to put it in. We had an empty fishbowl. I'm going to put it in the fishbowl. And again, this is pre-internet, right? So I didn't really know what to feed it, but we had leftover fish food. And so I fed it fish food and it totally worked. Like the tadpole ate the fish food and it grew into a frog. And my mom was blown away. Like she, I, she really was surprised. Like, what are you doing? But she let me do my thing. That's another thing. Like she let me do my thing and bring home rocks. But I also brought home a water snake from the pit one time. And (laughs) well, actually it was not a water snake. It was a gardener snake. So it was much bigger with a friend and I put it in the bathtub and my sister was trying to get ready to go somewhere. So again, she's eight years older than me. So like teenager, Mm -hmm. makeup, all the stuff. And I told my friend, like my sister was like, Andrea, I need you to get out of the bathroom because I need to get in there and get ready. And I told my friend, I'm like, maybe she won't notice. Maybe she won't notice there's a snake in the bathtub. (laughs) And so we went out and like, I'm just waiting for her to put her makeup on and get ready. And all of a sudden I just hear this like blood curling scream. (laughs) Ah, Andrea. And she, she like hated snakes. So that's one of our, that's like family folklore, but. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's a good story. Yeah. My mom didn't get mad. She just made me clean the bathtub out, but I, (laughs) yeah. 
I spent a lot of time just catching creatures and bringing wow. them home. So it was at fun. the pit. I mean, at isn't the pit. that the thing? It's like you know. I think sometimes it's so much simpler than we make it out to be. You know, it's like what are our kids gonna remember? They remember the gravel pit. We were over yeah. at a friend's house recently, and um, they just have this massive pile of sticks. I mean, it's so huge. Like the kids can crawl on it. You know. I don't even I don't even know why they where it's from or I don't know they moved to this house which is a huge pile of sticks because like, can you get us a pile of sticks <laughs> we want our pile handing sticks. over like iPhones or like yeah I just want a pile of sticks so, that's awesome anyway no well, seriously that's the best gift for your yeah. kids gravel pit some sticks yep. <laughs> well Andrea I just I thank you for your time thank you for what you're doing I'm so thrilled that we've connected and um, I just know you have so many important and um, pertinent resources for parents. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It was my pleasure. 